Welcome everyone, Lucas here. Today's show is called Beat Back Cancer Naturally and I am joined here with Dr. Dominic Brandy. Dr. Brandy is a medical doctor, practiced for over 40 years, and then about five years ago had a complete change of focus and a, a, a rude awakening, got a cancer diagnosis with a condition called multiple myeloma, which many of you will be new to, which we'll learn more about, and through lifestyle interventions, things like diet and exercise and nutritional supplements and lifestyle stress management, he's managed to get his cancer in remission. This is a... a incurable form of cancer, at least that's what's believed now. And his work now focuses on helping people do the same, prevent cancer, manage cancer, all of the above. He's got a book. It's called, the book is called Beat Back Cancer Naturally. Website is naturalinsightsintocancer.com. Dr. Dominic, welcome to the show. Hey, it's, it's great to be here. You know, everyone, every family has a experience with cancer. So like when I was growing up, my kid brother had uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And so I always kind of saw the world through that lens and that protocol. And, you know, he right. had hardcore chemo and radiation, went through this whole routine wow. and he, uh, did great. Um, you know, he got all bloated and lost all his hair and looked crazy, but he was like <laughs> in remission after two and a half months and he was fine. I mean, he, he is fine. He was fine. Um, and so, you know, I never had this thing where, for, for me, these doctors were miracle workers and this chemo and this radiation and he got scarred. Right, and right, it, was, right. I was like, it was like, it worked. And then I talked to other people and they tell me kind of the opposite. They've gone down this crazy cancer rabbit hole where they're just like this, you know, slash and burn and cut approach to cancer is crazy and it makes things worse. Help, help people understand when we're talking about cancer, it's actually like hundreds of hundred or dozens or hundreds of conditions, right? It's very, very different depending on what people are dealing with. Is that Fair. Well, there's many different types of cancers. Yeah. And in your brother's situation, I, I will tell you, if you go through the scientific literature, uh, young people, usually with leukemia, yeah. they go into remission and they pretty much stay in remission. But if somebody's older, different story. Right? You know, it's yeah. very common for them to go. For instance, my mother died at the age of uh, 57. Um, she had acute my myelocytic uh, leukemia. And she went into a remission and then she relapsed. Then she went into another remission, relapsed. And last time, you know, like she died. And that's typically what you'll find in, in older patients. But younger people actually do quite well with, uh, with leukemia. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, people need to understand about cancer and why somebody that's older would have a little bit of a harder time with it is that before you are even diagnosed with cancer, for instance, the type of cancer I have, multiple myeloma, uh, Mikhail Munchke, he's a famous uh, myeloma uh, researcher, and he uh, found that you need about 5,000 DNA mutations in the cancer cell before that cancer actually turns uh, you know, into, into cancer. Huh. And then when you relapse, you're actually up to about 12,000 DNA mutations. So one of the things I always counsel uh, cancer patients when I'm doing uh, you know, cancer coaching is you really have to try to eat as many plant foods as possible because plants have about 63 times the antioxidant activity compared to uh, animal products because you really want to keep your DNA mutations to a minimum mm. because the more DNA, if you're eating a crappy diet, you're not sleeping, you're under a lot of stress. I mean, you're going to definitely get more DNA mutations and you're going to have a higher chance of relapsing. So, so that's one of the things I always focus with, uh, with people try to improve their, you know, their diet, try to eat more of a plant strong diet. And there's a lot of supplements that I recommend. Uh, most of them are herbal supplements to help them, uh, you know, in their battle uh, against this really formidable disease. Can you help people uh, maybe, maybe just share your story about how you figured it out? Um, uh, quite, quite coincidentally, I, I've actually been researching myeloma just two weeks ago before, before, you know, you and I got in touch and, um, almost, almost, almost spooky in terms of the, the coincidence, but, um, help, help people understand. Cause if I understand right, this is one I've heard of smoldering myeloma where people don't know they have it for five years they end up breaking a bone or something like that. And then other things, obviously, you know, like my little brother ended up with a tumor on his neck. It was easier to see how, how did your diagnosis go? Was it later stage or yeah, the way my story is kind of interesting. You know, I got diagnosed five years ago and, um, before I even got diagnosed, and it's kind of like part of my story, is two months before that, my wife and I were on a two-week Viking cruise. And I've read over 300 books on health and nutrition. I've had a, you know, a plastic surgery, med spa, anti-aging center for 
over 40 years. So I've always been interested in health and nutrition. So anytime I'm on a vacation, I read a health and nutrition book. It went on Kindle and a book by Michael Greger. I don't know if you've read it. It's I called know, How Not to Die. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought, I thought the title was kind of intriguing. So I started reading it. And two days into this book, I tell my wife, I am going to start eating whole food plant-based mm. because the the science was just so overwhelming that people in cultures that ate more plant-based had less cancer, heart disease, dementia, all-cause mortality. So I'm on this cruise with all this meat and dairy yeah. and dirts and, you know, I'm eating whole food <laughs> plant-based. Well, what was weird was I come home, the same week that I came home, I, I felt a little kind of pain in my right clavicle. And I, I thought maybe it was tendonitis from doing surgery, whatever. And um, it just kept getting worse and worse. And then about, it was about a month after that, it started keeping me up at night. I remember telling my wife, I think I have bone cancer. And she thought I was crazy. She goes, you're the healthiest guy I know. Mm. And two weeks after that, we were watching television. I actually accidentally knocked over a container of water. I lunged for it. And I, my collarbone just cracked right in half. Wow. I mean, it was a crazy evening. Uh, we went to the... Uh, you know, the urgent care center had an x-ray. It was completely displaced. I had an MRI. I had a three-centimeter plasma cytoma. Uh, and then they did a bunch of blood work. And then they came up with the diagnosis of multiple myeloma. And the type that I have is a, uh, a, a, a it's an IgA. You actually have IgA, IgG, and IgM. Mm. And before myeloma actually becomes myeloma, you were talking about you know, MGUS and smoldering. Yeah. So I probably had MGUS, you know, probably like 20 years ago. And then, you know, probably, probably 10 years ago, it went to smoldering and I didn't know it. And then all of a sudden, you know, it goes from smoldering to, um, to, you know, a multiple myeloma. Actually, 3% of the population actually have MGUS and they don't even know it. Huh. Uh, my brother actually has MGUS. Uh, huh. he, has a, he has an IgM. So he goes in every six months and they just kind of, there's some biomarkers that they check to see if it's, you know, if it's progressing. Um, but, it's, but what's interesting about my whole situation is when I went in to see the oncologist, you know, I had already been on a plant-based diet for two months and I knew I was going to do well mm. just from the science. Mm. And he wanted me to do a triple regimen, two uh, oral medications, and then a shot I would have to do into my abdomen, which... Almost everybody that gets that shot, it's called Velcade, gets mm. a peripheral neuropathy. And, you know, being a surgeon, I didn't want it, anything to affect my hands or my feet. Mm. And peripheral neuropathy definitely does that. So I told him, I'm not doing the Velcade. Yeah. So he pulled me into a side room to have this other patient talk me into doing the Velcade. <laughs> <laughs> and I talked to him. And that guy's actually a really good friend of mine now. We go to lunch all the time. And I went back and I saw the oncologist and I said, hey, I'm not doing the Valkyrie. And he was super upset. He didn't huh. think I was going to get into remission. So I, I just did the two oral medications with my whole food plant-based diet. Mm. I went on a like major you know, research of the scientific literature because I wanted to find every single thing that I could do that was natural that could fight this. And every month, my numbers just kept getting better. In fact, I would post them on my Facebook page. Hmm. And by six months, I was in a complete remission. I mean, it was, and you know, and I'm still on medication, but I'm on a very low dose. Uh, like I said, it is incurable. Um, you know, hopefully someday they'll have a cure. But I really try to manage it. You know, I've been five years in remission. The average person with myeloma, uh, there was an article in the Journal of Leukemia. Usually, they relapse at about twenty six. Uh, months after they uh, start the first line treatment. So okay. I'm already like way past that. Yeah. If you were able to, you said, you know, you suspect it might have been cooking for 20 years. If you were able to go back 20 years, would you be able to get tested? Is there a test that would have identified it? And if you did find it, what would you do? What does your brother do? Well, one of the things I noticed was my uh, creatinine level yeah. was like gradually going up because it does. Uh, myeloma is the cancer of the plasma cells yeah. and plasma cells make antibodies. So what happens in this plasma cell that's gone kind of haywire is that it makes an antibody. It's called a monoclonal antibody that doesn't do anything. All it does is damage tissue. Some people call it a pair of protein. So yeah. one of the things that it does damage is your uh, kidney 
Um, and I noticed my creatinine levels were like, they weren't abnormal, but they were like, you know, I would get my lab work every uh, year and I just noticed they were like going up. Mm. So looking back, that was definitely one thing. And I noticed my platelets were always on the low side. They mm. were like always very low normal. Sometimes they were even below normal. And, you know, I didn't really think a whole lot of it. But looking back, that was probably a sign that, you know, there was something going on there. And yeah. some, you know, some of my ca my cancer patients that I coach that have myeloma, um, you know, one of them, she was actually a patient of mine and her total protein on her uh, SMA, they, it's kind of a profile of all your protein you know, yeah. uh, electrolytes and so forth. Hers was elevated and it was actually elevated for a while. I mean, she had two doctors that didn't pick this up. So, yeah. um, so it's something in, in myeloma presents in a lot of different ways. Some mm. people have um, severe bone pain. Uh, some people end up with, you know, like present with, uh, you know, kidney failure. Yeah. Uh, some people get pneumonia because their immune system's kind of out of whack. So it, it, it definitely kind of uh, is misdiagnosed quite a bit in the early stages. Let's say you did find out 20 years ago. Obviously, the things you're doing now, you could have started sooner. But from an, oh, yeah. from an allopathic <laughs> approach, would there have been anything that would have been offered or would it be a, a wait and see, get blood tests every six months or what, what, what is the approach? Well, my brother has an IgM and he basically, uh, he presented with tingling, he, like a peripheral neuropathy in okay. his feet. Okay. And IgM is actually the least aggressive. IgA, the one I have is the most aggressive. IgG is kind of in the middle and IgM is the least. Mm. Um, but he goes in every six months and they just check, you know, as they call it an M spike, you know, they kind of see where that is. Um, and, uh, you know, he gets his, uh, his nerve conduction, you know, uh, study just to make sure that that's okay. But his paraprotein is definitely, even as an MGUS patient, it's definitely, uh, causing some destruction of his, of some of his nerve endings. So, mm. So plant-based diet, what, for, you know, from an anti-cancer perspective, what, what is that actually, wh wh where is the magic? Is it the antioxidants? Is it the fiber? Is it the water content? Is it all of the above? I, I really think it's many different factors, but I, I think um, if you just kind of go to the, some of the basics, because, you know, when you start talking about, you know, whole food plant-based diets to people or like a plant-strong diet, they kind of get freaked out yeah. by it. But, but if you look at the National Cancer Institute of, uh, you know, the National Cancer Institute, um, you know, they recommend nine servings of fruits and vegetables for the prevention of cancer. So, mm. you know, that's about as conventional as you will get. Sure. And if you look at the, uh, I know I've listened to some of your podcasts and, you know, some of your guests have talked about the blue zones. Yeah. You know, if you look at the areas of the world where people live the longest, I mean, they eat primarily a 90 to 95 percent plant based diet and they get most of their protein from beans. And I think beans are probably one of the one of the greatest longevity foods that you can ingest on it on a daily basis. Mm. Um, and then in my book, I go through a lot of the, uh, you know, the literature. I kind of refer, I don't know if you ever read the China study yeah. where they, you know, the China, uh, it was an, the Oxford Cornell project where they studied uh, 65 different counties in uh, China and they followed these people for, you know, 10 years. And they found those that ate more plant based had less cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia, all cause mortality. Um, and then, you know, there's, if you go through the scientific literature and, you know, Dr. Greger's book, the book that I mentioned yeah. to you, I don't know if you've ever seen the hardback, it's about two inches yeah. and about an inch of it are scientific references. But if you go through the science, um, you know, there's many articles, um, you know, one of the ones I have in my book is the British Journal of Cancer 2009, where they looked at over 60,000, you know, people followed them over 12 years. And those that ate more plant-based had much less cancer compared to those that were omnivores. And there was one of the annals of uh, internal medicine. I think they looked at, uh, it was about 60,000 plus in that it was like 10 years and they came up with the same conclusions. But the literature is pretty replete with the fact that when you eat more plant-based, you have less all-cause mortality. Mm. Cancer is one of the things. And I know you've had guests on there that promote these carnivore diets yeah. and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have a problem with people eating a little meat, but I do think diets that are primarily plant-based are definitely the healthiest. 
Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm coming up on 21 years on plants, and I don't talk about it that often because immediately people want to know. Oh, exactly. really? <laughs> and um, yeah, I kind of went closeted about 12 years ago. And um, yeah, it's worked really well for me. And that I, uh, although oddly, I get less and less confident about it for other people as the years go on, um, just because there's so many variables. You know, it was interesting. The, the, the COVID thing really opened my eyes to this. I was so interested in staying healthy. And really quickly, I started talking to people who they didn't care that much. And they didn't care that much if they got sick. And some people didn't even care that much if they died. They wanted to go on vacation. And I realized, like, yeah. <laughs> I, I realized, I, really, really, people didn't care. And they, they weren't being flipped. They, they really, you know, they would much. And I realized, like, oh, we're not playing with the same deck of cards here. You know, I'm, I'm really thinking about things differently. And some people would much rather, I don't know, carry an extra 10 or 12 pounds of lean muscle on their upper body and consume, you know, 150 grams of animal protein per day or whatever. And the, the, people just have very different objectives. But, you know, consistently over the years, I've had Dr. Greger on the show and a bunch of people, it, it, the, the anti-cancer message, I haven't seen, no one's really refuted that very well from a plant-based perspective. I mean, it seems pretty solid. I, I, I you know, that, that is one thing that it seems like pretty consistently, uh, mainstream medical, alternative medical people really agree. You know, if you're looking to battle cancer, there's some serious advantages. I do get kind of, yeah, one of the things I always, yeah. uh, you know, mention. I ha actually have a lecture on it in my, on my website, natural cancer, uh, natural insights into cancer yeah. is that plants have, uh, over 25,000 phytonutrients and some researchers feel there's over 100,000. Mm. And when these phytochemicals synergize, I mean, it is incredible what happens. There's one study that I always refer to, uh, where they, uh, they were looking at breast cancer cells, you know, in a petri dish, and they applied. Uh, initially, they applied a grape extract, and it killed about twenty-five percent of the breast cancer cells. And they applied an onion extract, it killed about fifty percent of the cancer cells. Then they did a half and half mixture, half grape, half onion. Mm. It killed twenty-five percent of the cancer cells. Hmm. So there's this crazy synergy that sure. God put in the food yeah. where. These phytochemicals, and I, I kind of list them all in my book, uh, the different things that they do to cancer. I mean, they, they disrupt cell signaling. You know, they fragment the DNA. They inhibit proteasomes. Um, you know, they, they actually increase the ability of the tumor suppressor genes to suppress, and it causes the pro-apoptotic or the cancer cell suicide genes mm. in the cancer to actually kill themselves. So it, it's just amazing when you really get into the research, um, the way these phytochemicals work to fight cancer. I mean, it, it is incredible. And so in your work with yourself and with, with clients and readers and things, what, what, what has given people the most positive changes, whether it's, whether it's, you know, with their cancer, whether it's with their remission or just in terms of positive outcomes? Well, I think when, um, you know, I get an individual to kind of go more plant-based. I mean, they immediately notice a difference in the way that they feel. Mm. Uh, and and I don't know if you noticed this when you went more plant-based, but people, it just seems that they automatically start losing weight because plant foods are, you know, nutritionally dense and typically they're calorically low. Yeah. Um, and, and if you look at studies, you know, vegans, um, I don't even like to use the word vegan <laughs> because um, – in fact, one, uh, I just did a video and uh, I mentioned, uh, I don't know if you've ever read uh, Dr. McDougall's book called The Starch Solution, yeah. but he has a chapter in there called The Fat Vegan. Mm -hmm. And it's somebody that's eating like potato chips and, you know, yeah. pretzels and Oreo cookies and Coke all day. And they're, they're you know, they think they're healthy because they're avoiding meat and dairy. And that's probably the, you know, the unhealthiest diet, you know, that you could you know, that you could possibly eat. Um, but I've, I've just noticed that when people eat whole food, plant-based or plant strong, mm. you know, maybe 90, 95% of their diet being plant-based, they just have a lot more energy. They feel better. Yeah. They sleep better. Uh, and that's the other thing that I mentioned in my book. I go through um, a lot of the studies on sleep, mm. you know, how critical it is to try to get seven to eight hours of sleep because there's a lot of activity going on. Uh, in regard to cancer while you're sleeping. Uh, there's a lot of DNA repair going on. The body's undergoing autophagy, whereby, you know, it's cleaning up a lot of the proteins that are damaged, a lot of the cells that are not working properly. And it's kind of recycling a lot of those molecules. But, um, but melatonin release, uh, 
is extremely important. So melatonin is one of the most powerful anti-cancer chemicals that actually release by your body. It's really one of the most potent uh, antioxidants. So there's a lot going on d- during sleep. And that's why I strongly recommend people to try to get seven to eight hours of sleep. That seems to be the sweet spot. Mm. Um, you know, there was one study that I just read where uh, they looked at people that got five hours or less of sleep. They followed them for 25 years and they had a 25 percent higher all like mortality rate compared to people that got seven to eight hours. So, so sleep's really like super, super important. And these people just tend to sleep better, you know, when they're eating more whole food plant-based and then the exercise thing uh, is extremely important. Um, I don't know how many studies you've ever read on exercise and its relationship to cancer, but it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's almost unbelievable. um, You know, the way that it has an effect on, especially breast cancer. Mm. I mean, there was, there's a study I actually have in my book where uh, they looked at people that had breast cancer and then individuals that just, you don't have to do anything crazy. You know, they just briskly walk for 30 minutes per yeah. day for five days. Mm. They actually had a 24% lower relapse rate huh. compared to the control. And then if they upped it, you know, they, they ran two thirds of a mile a day, it, it lowered it by 40%. Wow. And then people that ran, 2.3 miles a day, it lowered it by 95%. So, Crazy. I mean, it's just amazing what exercise does to your immune system. Mm. I mean, it is just incredible. So much of the cancer fundraising, Race for a Cure, you know, um, it's great. But it, it mostly what I see is like testing, you know, the Race for the Cure. It's like, get a mammogram. And, you know, the, oh, yeah. and, and, yeah. and um, you know, this is important, but uh, the prevention just Prevention doesn't sell full stop. So there's there's just not a huge prevention market. But let's imagine our listeners are focused on prevention. Let's imagine that they are proactive. What can they do when they go to their doctor? Like what if you could go to your doctor 20 years ago? What things, what questions would you start to ask in terms of somebody who's looking at your blood specifically? I mean, obviously you can read your own panels, your your, your medical doctor, but how, you know, if you're talking to an oncologist, you're, you, what, what kind of questions can you ask? Because as you mentioned, very often something like myeloma just goes undetected. It's easy to overlook. It's a, it, it can be hiding in the background. What are the markers that people need to look at if they want to take agency over their, their blood well, work? Well, honestly, I think one of the, because the lab work typically will not like in my situation, like my creatinine was going up a little bit, but it was within normal limits. No red flags, yeah. You know, sure, my platelets sure. were a little bit low, normal, you know. But I would say the, the most important thing, you know, if if I'm a family doctor and I have a patient, first thing I would do is say, get your BMI right. 25 or below. Right, right. Because, you know, the, the studies show that when you are obese or you're just overweight, yeah your chances of getting cancer go up dramatically. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, one of the reasons is, you know, fat tissue releases these cytokines that are very pro-inflammatory. And we definitely know that you need chronic inflammation for cancer to even get started. Mm. I mean, you can't even get cancer cells to start growing without inflammation. So there has to be kind of a baseline of chronic information, uh, inflammation going on. And when you are overweight, I mean, that's a perfect milieu for starting cancer. And the other thing is, when your BMI is high, you're going to be much more prone uh, to getting type 2 diabetes. What happens uh, is that, you know, as you're uh, gaining weight, the other thing is, if you're not exercising, your muscle mass is deteriorating. So you start developing uh, insulin resistance. And when that happens, your insulin levels raise in your blood. And insulin is a very powerful growth stimulator of cancer. Uh, Most people don't realize that. And that's Mm. one reason why I think exercise has a very positive effect against cancer. It's not only the fact that it jacks up your natural killer cell activity. In fact, in my book, there's one study I refer to. uh, It just shows that even six minutes of exercise will jack up your natural killer cell activity by 50%. Mm. That's why a lot of people say, I don't have time to exercise. I go, you know what? Wake up in the morning, do like a six-minute band workout, sure. and guess what? Your immune system's in a, in a much better situation. But as far as going to, you know, to your doctor, I will tell you, uh, and you've probably heard this, most physicians don't know anything about nutrition. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when I went to medical school, we literally had probably 24 hours of nutrition and it, and it was like a high school health class. Yeah. It was like, okay, if you, you know, if you don't 
get enough vitamin C, you get scurvy. I yeah, mean, it yeah. was, it's, it's really absurd to be quite honest yeah. with you. Um, yeah, you, you know, I, you, you touched on something that makes me, you know, I, I always hear people say that sugar feeds cancer, but suddenly I'm wondering, is it more accurate that sugar spikes insulin and insulin spurs cancer yeah, growth? I mean, is, that, is, is that the more sophisticated, that, nuanced way to look at it? definitely part of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sugar is, you know, just so your uh, listeners know, um, you know, cancer works by a whole different uh, metabolic pathway, you know. Uh, one sugar molecule only produces two ATP energy molecules in a cancer cell. Now, in a normal cell, which needs oxygen for its metabolism, one sugar molecule will form 36 ATP. So mm. it's 36 versus two with cancer. I see. So cancer needs a lot of sugar just to keep itself going. Mm. So one of the things that I always coach with my cancer patients is, you know, try to you know, don't eat a lot of refined carbohydrates. Mm. Don't eat all this junk food, you know, potato chips, corn chips, Oreos, you know, and, uh, you know, white bread. You know, when you eat bread, try to eat something like Ezekiel or something that has, you know, a lot of fiber. In fact, a really good equation for your listeners, when you go to the grocery store, you'll see all this whole wheat bread. And I would say half of it is white bread that's just dyed brown. Brown white bread. But if you take if you take the carbohydrates and divide it by the fiber, it, the number should be five or less. Hmm. That's kind of a good equation for people to use to kind of pick, you know, the right, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, whole wheat bread, uh, you know, because that it can be kind of intimidating when you go to the grocery store and you see all these breads and a lot of them are really, you know, really not that good for you. Yeah. Um, but um, but, you know, eating more of a whole food plant based diet is is you know, definitely something that I strongly, uh, you know, recommend for uh, people to, you know, prevent this diabetic type situation that is very prevalent in the United States. You mentioned breaking your collarbone. Were there other symptoms? Do you continue to struggle with certain quality of life degradation or things you're limited with? Are you able to do impact exercise? What are things like now? Oh, my life is incredible. I mean, I live a very uh, unbelievable life. Um, you know, I sold my I the the business that I had my practice. It was the sixth ranked uh, plastic surgery med spa anti aging center in the United States. Oh, wow. Allergan, the company that makes Botox. So wow. I was able to. Uh, I had a venture capital group come in uh, three years ago, and they bought my uh, my practice. I stayed on for a couple years as an employee because they require you to do that. But but all my energy now is really you know focused on cancer and helping people uh, that are battling this disease and to prevent it. Uh, but I live an unbelievable life. I mean, I, uh, I have incredibly high energy levels. I exercise every day. I do 15 minutes of resistance bands every day. I ride my bike every day. My wife and I travel. We have a condo in Miami. I spend the whole winter, you know, in Miami and, and I'm able to do all my cancer work virtually. So, uh, for instance, I do, I do very uh, intensive lab testing. I check people's, uh, you know, their vitamin levels, their mineral levels, mm. amino acids, their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, mm. their uh, lipid profiles, their hemoglobin A1C. And I have them go to Quest Labs. Quest Labs are all over the place. Sure. And then Quest just um, faxes me the results. Like this morning, I wrote two letters to patients just kind of reviewing all their lab work. And you would – you would – it's hard to believe that even people that eat what I would think would be a healthy diet, you wouldn't believe a lot of the minerals that are deficient in people. Almost sure, everybody's sure. deficient in molybdenum. I, I can't even say that word. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's unbelievable, um, huh. like chromium, cobalt. I yeah. mean, it, it's, it's, it's really unreal how there's so many deficiencies when you start measuring these different levels in people. And how are you measuring these kind of trace minerals? I mean, they're, they're difficult to pick up and they're varying a lot, right? If you're looking at blood serum, do you have to do hair? Is well, that I do, uh, I do blood. It's a, okay. it's a blood stuff. Okay. So I, um, you know, there's different codes that I use and I have a, I kind of have a lab sheet and, and I'll tweak it based on the individual, but they go into quest, they get the lab work in about a week. I get the results yeah. and then I review them. And then, you know, I have another consult with the patient and then we tweak, like this morning, uh, I mean, there was one gentleman, uh, there were probably about 12 different supplements that I had to recommend for him because 
his his eye a lot of people are very low in iodine i mean it's interesting about one third of the world's population is iodine deficient huh. so i recommend that his vitamin d level was like super low yeah you know i personally think everybody should supplement with vitamin d yeah you know during the covid crisis one thing we did find was people that had higher higher vitamin d levels you know, definitely had lower incidence of COVID and death and the opposite, you know. Uh, so vitamin D is something that, I mean, I would say in the northern climate at this time of the year, I, I would say probably 90 percent of people are, are vitamin D deficient. Yeah. Um, but um, but the the vitamin mineral, you know, I check heavy metals also uh, like one lady this morning, she, her her lead levels were high. Right. She was an older woman. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I, I made some recommendations for her, you know, so. Um, Where do you think that lead's coming from? You think it's coming from old paint in her house well, or? You know, she was an older woman. It could be, you know, she was like 85 years old. It could be from like, maybe they have lead paint. Now, if you have yeah. porcelain bathtub mm. and you're getting in there every day, mm. you can get lead from that. Interesting. Um, you know, uh, and it's, it's actually in some foods, like, you know, some, some sweet potatoes have, okay. you know, high levels of lead, even carrots, you know, like if the, if the ground has a lot of lead in yeah. it, you could actually get lead toxicity from that. But, um, but we'll recheck her, you know, later. I really haven't talked to her since I sent the letter this morning, but, uh, but, you know, it's really interesting when you get these lab results back because, um, you know, sometimes you're like dumbfounded by it, uh, like, you know, some of these deficiencies. People who are interested in taking an active role in their health get overwhelmed. Supplements, blood tests, all the options. It, it's it's so much so that they get paralyzed and they inevitably have to give up their agency to a primary care physician who may or may not be the right person. And and that's not just I have nothing but respect for the medical community, but it's just that it's just an impossible job. Like here's me showing up for seven minutes, you know, m make sure I'm okay and not dying. And how, what, what do you, what do you envision for a future where perhaps we have a system where people, you, you know, like your clients, they're in really good hands. Most people are not in really good hands. How, how can that change? Well, I think as time goes on, I do think there is going to be more of a movement toward uh, people being more educated about plant foods. I think I think Dan Butner with the Blue Zones is doing a uh -huh. great job with educating people. Um and I, you know, I think a lot of it's really education. One of the things I always recommend, I used to have uh, monthly meetings at one of my med spas. I used to bring in mm. speakers and so forth. And it stopped with uh, when the COVID hit. Sure. But um, it was before I would start those meetings, I would always have people go to nutritionfacts.org. I don't know if you're familiar with that website. Yeah. But Dr. Greger has uh, over 20 scientists uh in his group, they review every single article in the clinical nutritional literature. Last year, they reviewed 190,000 articles. And then they take all the science and they make these five minute videos, which are like extremely informative and they're all evidence based. So I always would have the people that were at the meeting, you know, put it on their phone, put the icon on there, and I would tell them, hey, listen, try to listen to a video every day. And, mm -hmm. and Dr. Greger, when you sign up, uh, you get a video mail to you, email to you every day. I've so like, I probably have like ten of them on there. I got to listen to, but I usually <laughs> yeah. uh, put them on while I'm uh, like getting ready in the morning. Mm. Um, but if you do that, you will constantly be educated because I really think for people to give up pizza or chicken wings or you yeah. know like you know, hamburgers, yeah, you have to know why you're doing it. And I really sure. think that you know being educated is the most important uh, thing that you need to do. Because if you're constantly reminded, you're definitely going to be making positive changes every day. Love what you're doing, Dominic. I know people will be excited to pick up your book. Tell people where to find your book and where to connect with you online. Well, they can uh, go to my website. If they go to my website uh, to get the book, I give them a signed copy. You can also get it on Amazon. It's in hardback, paperback, Kindle, audio, um, you know, if somebody wants uh, to do a virtual consultation with me, there's an area on my website where you can sign up. And then after that, if you want to do this extensive lab testing, uh, I can do that. And then I have 24 seven uh, coaching. So if somebody signs up for that, they can text me, email me whenever they want, two o'clock in the morning. And uh, and I have patients that are con I mean, every day I get 
hammered with text messages. Like people's <laughs> lab work might come in and they, yeah. they're all nervous. Hey, is this, is this, am I going to die tomorrow? <laughs> and I look at it and I, Hey, everything's cool. You're good. You're in great shape, you know, but, um, but it's really, it's the 24 seven coaching. Like I charge $20 a month. It's really not that much. Uh, but it really does give, uh, patients a sense of reassurance because they know I'm always there for them. Yeah. You know, a lot of times they'll read an article on the internet and they want, Hey, what do you think of this supplement or whatever? And sure. I'll kind of give them my feedback on it. But, uh, yeah. but, uh, but my website's a great way. I also have a, an Instagram site. It's called cancer veggie doc. Hmm. Uh, I do one to two posts every day on there. And if that's something they're interested in. Um, you know, they can check that out. I also have a YouTube and a, and a Facebook page. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate the conversation. It was and great. I appreciate your work. I love your show, by the way. You do a great job. Thanks so much.